Welcome everybody, I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the Biotech Center. I also work for UW Extension Cooperative Extension. Thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for having the Wisconsin Alumni Association here. And as you know, when we don't have um, Wisconsin Public Television, I generally do a more informal presentation. Um, our presenter tonight is Professor Hao Chang from Dermatology. He's from China, and I do not know the geography of China, and I usually ask people where they're from. And you know, if they say they're from Soldiers Grove or Verona, I can tell the difference. <laughs> so can you tell us where you were born and where you were raised? Okay, sure thing. Um, can you hear me well over, the, over there? Okay, so um, as a matter of fact, I'm pulling out United States map, trying to find a corresponding location of my hometown. It would be somewhere Kansas or Missouri, you know, the middle part. Oh, my condolences. Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> so in the middle, what's the name of the town? Um, it, it's called, it's, I, I really doubt you can pronounce it. It's, it's called Maanshan. It's, it's, a, it's a mountain, looks like a saddle. That's the name it's from. I'm pretty sure if you Google it, you probably can find, find uh, thousands of places with the same name, like a saddle-shaped mountain. Nice. But there's no mountain. We uh, flat them all. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, welcome proud. to West Virginia. I like that. That's good. You're going to do well here in America. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, you got your undergraduate degree? Yes. Uh, I spent quite a lot of time in Shanghai. Uh, probably you're more familiar with Shanghai. I did my undergraduate there. I did my master's degree there. I uh, spent like eight years there. And then I moved on, did my uh, PhD st uh, study in uh, Texas. Texas. Again, you're going to give my condolence. I, I know that. So I spent, I, spent, I spent six years in Texas, and then apparently Texas is too hot for me. So I moved to Maryland, did my uh, uh, postdoc training uh, at the Hopkins. And again, uh, Maryland is too hot for me, so I moved here last summer. And then I have to say, uh, last winter is not cold enough for me. I'm going to move to Canada. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> now, I don't know, if, but you know there's a song called it's too hot for me, too, too hot for me. Okay, no, That's I'm never. never mind. Okay. We'll, we'll have a beer afterwards and I'll All explain right. to you. Oh, there is a beer afterwards? I hope so. Oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> um, so what part of Canada are you going to move to? Uh, I don't know. Um, okay. I know they're very friendly recently to United States yes. uh, citizens. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. I highly recommend Calgary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, as you know from my little missive last week and this week, I had the great joy of having a basal cell carcinoma. 17 years ago. You're not necessarily going to be talking about that, but that certainly raised my uh, awareness of the skin that we're all in and what it can do and sometimes how things go awry. Uh, I'm looking forward to our talks on dermatology. You're about to give one. Say hello, because you're going to give one in what, three weeks? Four weeks? Yes. Yes. And uh, so Originally, we had hair patterns and skin cancer as the topic, but specifically, uh, Professor Chang's going to talk about cleave but not leave, this gene and protein called astrotactin 2 and patterning, um, mammalian skin. I thought it was very interesting that you also mentioned, um, was it insects? The bristles on insects? Yes, Drosophila flies. So Drosophila flies. flies, there's yes. things that are similar. So I think this might be an interesting night for learning more about the integument which is really similar to integrity, which, you know, we could use some more of. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Professor Chang to Wednesday Night Lab. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for the very nice introduction. I have to confess, I'm not going to talk about basal cell carcinoma. I'm not going to t talk about insect. I'm sorry about that. So uh, uh, I'm going to do a warm-up for um, Chris. Chris is going to talk a lot of uh, skin disease uh, when uh, he presents three weeks from now. I'm gonna, I hope I can uh, get you guys interested in other aspect of the skin. Um, so I'm trying to forward. So which one is to forward the slides? Where to forward? Oh, okay, can move. So what you should in. always do is put the keyboard up where your speaker can't find right. it. <laughs> uh, you know, we're so used to the touch screen, but this says do not touch, and then I don't know what to do. <laughs> Okay. All right, so normally I, I will put the acknowledgments at the last, but today I want to put the, my acknowledgments in the front. Oh, probably there is a way I can dim this. Do I need to dim the podium lights? Is it too bright? 
No? I'm good at dim. OK. There's a dim stage lights here. Should I press it? OK. All right, that's good. good. All right. Good. Yeah, I normally uh, put the acknowledgments in the end, but today I want to put it in front because you know, when I started my lab last summer, I started to, to realize how much I took for granted you know, when I spend time in, you know, train in, in, in my uh, uh, advisor mentor to a mentor's lab, you know, you start to run the lab, you build up everything, you realize how much work to set up the stage for graduate student or postdoc to do the real experiment. You know, when I was a graduate, undergraduate student and a postdoc, I didn't realize all these hard work behind the scene, you know, get the bread on the, sta on the table and everything like that. Now, since I start to run my lab, I start to realize that's a lot of work. But anyway, shown here, the two gentlemen I want to give my acknowledgments to. One is uh, German, uh, Richard Benger. He's my uh, post, uh, he's my, uh, I'm sorry about that. He's my uh, thesis advisor. He's a fantastic mouse geneticist. I, I think most of my genet uh, you know, genetic training in the mouse handling, I learned from uh, his lab. He's at the UT MD Anderson Cancer Center. I still remember I inject the DNA into the pronuclear of the mouse embryo to generate transgenic uh, mice. I also uh, manipulate the mouse embryonic stem cells and make a mutant uh, ES cells, embryonic stem cells, inject them into a blastus to make a chimera, and then make a knockout mouse line. So all these training are done in, uh, in, in his lab. I really appreciate that. I also, uh, I think when I did my rotation, he took me to the mouse room and hand by hand showed me how to handle the mice. You know, now I think about this, it's really funny. Shouldn't that job be done by RARC or something like that, not by the boss? But anyway, so uh, he said, I'll just want, want mention one advice. I think the best advice he gave me, or oh, he gave me tons of advice. Um, he, uh, we are looking at the mouse. Mouse are very small. Uh, he showed me how to grab the mouse, and he said something uh, like this. He said, like, how? Uh, you're bigger than a mouse. Learn to control mouse. Uh, don't let the mouse to control you. He probably said this in a plain way, but I somehow I, I took that in a very sophisticated way. I took this as a metaphor, you know, how to control mouse experiment, not really. But nonetheless, I think that advice is um, still benefit a lot from that advice. Uh, Jeremy Nasons, the work I'm going to talk to you, most of the story I've done in uh, uh, his lab when I was a postdoc. He's a true scientist. Uh, he spent, he works seven days, seven days a week, and he's still very active at bench and then in the mouse room, uh, dealing with all the, the mouse maintaining. He's, uh, I just give one example again, and because of time of sake, I don't want to say too much. I can say a lot of things about him, but just one example. One uh, PhD student passed the qualify exam, and then um, he said to her, said like, yay, we should celebrate. Uh, we should celebrate by uh, doing more mini preps. I think to him, uh, doing the experiment, it's a real uh, celebration for him. He is uh, very enjoying uh, doing the experiment. Uh, yes. Um, okay, that's enough for the acknowledgments. I don't want to spend hours and hours on this. And then uh, I want to tell you a little bit more about the, uh, the hair patterning. So I don't have an outline today. But basically, the stories I'm going to tell you, they're in a chronological order. So I'll just drift with the time. You can see what the story is going. So basically, it's a one story related to the, uh, a specific mouse. We call this rich mice. So first, I'm going to tell you about how we identify this rich mice. So uh, Jeremy's lab is uh, focused on the, a set of genes called frizzled. Uh, I don't know how you guys are familiar with frizzled, but basically, it's a receptor for the wind ligand. What I've shown here is the simplified diagram. Trust me, it's already a simplified diagram of how this wind signaling works. So without the wind ligands, here is the frizzle. That's our topic gene here. It's a membrane receptor. Without the ligands, the system is off. Uh, there's nothing going on transcriptionally, which means no target genes expression or something like that. But when you have the wind ligand, will bind to the frizzle receptor, and then that will activate the signaling. You have an accumulation of a, a protein called beticatinin. Since you have a lot of beticatinin, and then beticatinin can accumulate and then translocate to, this, to the nucleus and then activate the transgene, activate the uh, transcription of the downstream genes. You know, this signaling can do a lot of things, you know, proliferation, differentiation, cancer, a lot of things are related to this. But I just to want you to bear in mind, this is a receptor on the cell membrane. That's the whole take point uh, of this slide. 
So Drosophila only have uh, one fossil, which is easy, but as always, humans or the mammals are very complicated. We have 10. So shown here are the cluster, uh, the all 10 fossil receptors based on the primary sequence, as you can see. Three and six are highlighted below. I will tell you why. And then the other uh, eight are clustered at the bottom, at the top. So the reason why, the, remember, the, remember the signal I, was, I talked previous slides, you know, all those frizzle that went bind to the wind, so they're going to activate the beta cadenin and then activate the canonical wind signaling. So these two frizzles are very special. So they don't activate the canonical wind signaling. That's why they are called non-canonical frizzle receptors. So, so if we look at the uh, gene structures of these frizzles, frizzle three and six are also special. You know, while the other seven, there are only one exon, which means there is no internal internal sequence inserted into that coding. Whole thing is one single exon. And then three and six, uh, they share. They both have five introns. Introns are those uh, uh, non-coding. You cannot say junk sequence in between the coding, but you can see by the by the uh, uh, by the uh, DNA sequence, three and six also stand out at the individual subgroup. So as I said, uh, so there are 10 frizzles in the mouse. Uh, so Jeremy's lab, we knock out them all, so one to 10. So, the, um, so how the system runs is like this. You know, one, graduate or one graduate student or one postdoc will analyze one of the knockout, you know, get the different knockouts and then analyze the phenotype, try to figure out what's the function of that gene. You know, as a mouse geneticist, you know the the you know the more severe the the mice look, the happier we are. Yeah, we are pathetic, but that's the way you can analyze the gene function. So uh, Nini Guo, a former graduate student in the lab, knocked out the frizzle six. By no means, by any means, you know the mice looks very normal and then very he healthy, running in the cage, mate normally, very happy which is a very disappointment, uh, disappointment uh, to her. And then, if you look really careful, uh, shown here are the flat mount, means you take out the skin, this is the hind paw, you just dissect the paw and flat it, and then make the tissue transparent. And now you can see all these uh, dark colors, or the black are those hair follicles, because they're hair shaft, because they're pigmented. You can see, the hairs, they're all, here are the digits. Here is the, will be the proximal close to the body. That will be distal away from the body. You can see they're all fanning out uh, very nicely. However, in the frizzle 6 knockout shown in the right, you can see the hair form a, a, a typical war in, in the, uh, in the paw, paw center. So that means something is messed up. And then, so the, if you look at the skin earlier, uh, so the mouse picture I show you is like two weeks old. If you look at earlier, at P3, look at the flat mount again on the back. And then again, the black is the melanin pigmentation to show the hair orientation. You can see the wall type. Now the left will be the head, anterior. And then the right side of the screen will be posterior, the tail. You can see all the hairs that align perfectly from the anterior to posterior, parallel to each other. And then if you look at the frizzle six knockout, uh, mice, the hair apparently uh, are randomized. Nearly randomized, uh, keep that in mind, they're not totally randomized, uh, nearly randomized. That would be very important for the talk of my uh, later part. And then what happened is, they start from a, a misorientation at the very beginning, early on, P3, postnatal day three, and then there's a gradually, there's a further six independent postnatal refinement process going on, what it does is, you know, the hair follicles will align themselves to the neighbors to minimize the angular difference, and eventually they all look like a wild type. Shown here is the uh, 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 day eight, um, which is, you know, day three, they're randomized. Day 14, they're totally parallel. This is a kind of ca cut in between, you can see. Shown here are uh, uh, a flat mount of a mouse back skin this is the vector map show. You can see that these are the two eyelids, and then these are the two ears. You can see all the hairs, all these red arrows indicate the hair follicle orientation. You can see they're all parallel, pointing from the head to tail. And those are the real image from there. And then if you look at the frizzle six knockout, 
you can see at this time point, it already looks like a wild type. There is still some uh, left over. They still haven't adjusted to the wild type yet, but you can see most of the part, mo the hair follicle in most of the region, they already point to the correct direction. So the phenotype gradually disappear. And then this can, this refinement process keep continues going on and going on. And after, you, after a few days later, at two weeks, they just like wild type. So the, that's the reason why Nini uh, missed the phenotype, because at two weeks old, the knockout mice just look like uh, the wild type. Well, if you don't look at the hind paw. <coughs> so one lesson from there is when you have a mouse, a mutant mouse, when you try to characterize the phenotype, you cannot just look at the mouse like this. You really have to like zoom in and look very carefully for the phenotype. Otherwise, you will miss that. But not all the uh, Fraser 6 knockout, they will align themselves to the wild type. We found this mouse line, a mouse in a, um, by accident in the mating cages. Apparently, you can see, we call this ridge mice. And then because there's a trans, transverse ridge along the, uh, uh, the back, you can see this is the top view, this is the side view. Definitely is not look like wild type. And then put it together with the non-ridge, uh, I showed this picture earlier. Non-ridge will look like just the wild type, and then the ridge, you can see this transverse ridge ac across the, uh, the back. And then it will be uh, more obvious in a mouse with a light uh, coat color. And then if you look at the uh, uh, skin prep uh, at the uh, day eight, now you can see while the regular Fraser 6 start to adjust themselves to a wild type, you can see these guys, the hairs in the lower back, they all point to the wrong direction. And then when those hairs in the lower back bump into the hair from the head and then cause this ridge phenotype. So here I just show more of these, uh, the non-ridge versus the ridge. You can see essentially their phenotype is very consistent. All the ridge mice, the lower back, the hair in the lower back that point to the wrong direction. And then all the regular non-rich Fraser 6, non 6 mutants, they all align them in the process of uh, looking like a wild type. So uh, we did some uh, uh, test cross. We know that phenotype, that rich phenotype is a recessive, which means you take a ridge, cross a ridge, all the progenies, 100% of them, will look like a ridge. If you take a ridge, cross a non-rich, all of the progeny, they will just look like non-rich. And then if you cross that progeny together into each, to each other, and then you will have a one quarter of the chance to have the ridge. So that strongly suggests you know, it's a recessive uh, modified phenotype of that ridge. So with that knowledge, we have confidence to say, oh, this is, might be something we can uh, 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 identify what exactly the modify is. So the first thing we did was we did an analysis called SNP array, single nucleotide polymorphism array. You know, the mouse, different strains, uh, the humans are you know, very uh, heterogeneous. The mouse are relatively inbred, but still different strains, they have different nucleotide sequence at the different location. So it's like a signature of the strain, right? So, uh, and then if you compare a strain, for example, the black strain versus the agouti strain, by tell the nucleotide sequence at that locus, you can tell it is a black or versus a, 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 a goody. So in that way, you can trace that specific phenotype to the location of that, of that genomic sequence, so, and then link to the phenotype to the genotype. This is what is called SMP array. So basically what it does is, you can link that gene, uh, link that rich phenotype to a specific loci. So we did the genome-wide uh, uh, SNP array and found that rich phenotype only linked to one locus in the chromosome 4, which is very encouraging, right? So if, uh, if the phenotype is controlled by multiple loci, we'll, that will make your, the identification of the mutation very difficult. If it's only controlled by one single locus, it's very easier, relatively easier to know what the mutation is. That really set the stage of the following uh, the, uh, 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 sections I'm going to talk to you. Uh, so I will give a little summarize. I realize, you know, summarize from time to time help move one part to the other part. So I told you, I showed you the ridge phenotype is characterized by the transverse ridge, and then the ridge is caused by the hair from the posterior 
bumping to the hair from the anterior and then cause the ridge. And then this ridge phenotype is linked to one locus on the mouse chromosome 4, and then it's recessive. So in the next part, I'm going to show you, uh, we identify the astrotactin 2 gene as the ridge gene. So how, how we identify that uh, mutation. So I told you the SNP array, uh, the genome SNP array shows there are only one locus linked to that ridge, but it's on the chromosome scale. If you look, look in, into that region, enlarge that region, it's a region of uh, several megabase. Actually, it's uh, over 30 megabase. There's a lot of hundreds and hundreds of genes in that region. So how, do you, uh, how can you figure out which gene is linked to the phenotype? There are apparently two ways to do that. One is through, oops, sorry, through exomal sequencing. Basically, you find all those coding sequence, and then sequence for that, find the mutation. Uh, that is very quick, a quick way to identify the mutation. But the downside of that is you don't know necessarily that mutation is causing the phenotype because you, it's likely you will find out 10 or 10 plus difference between the rich versus the non-rich. How are you going to tell exactly which one is causing the phenotype? So the other method is called meiotic recombination mapping. Uh, so it is a very tedious, slow, but the plus side of that is you always follow that phenotype. You know exactly what the mutation is causing the phenotype. I will show you uh, one or two more slides to help you understand what, how the meiotic recombination mapping is working. So basically it's like this. So we know the rich phenotype based on the SNP analysis. The rich phenotype is linked to a strand called 129. So shown here in red. And then the, the mutation is not in the uh, uh, black six background shown here in the green. As you can see, the rich mutation is homodigous, which means both of the copies, you know, uh, they have, the rich mice have both chromosome with that mutation to show a rich phenotype. In a non-rich, you know, since you only have one mutation, and then the other is a, 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 a B6 background, the mice will show no ridge. And when you do the test, when you cross these animals together, because during the meiosis, the chromosome, the sister chromosome, will exchange some of the DNA content. So in a way, you can keep, replenish some of the uh, 129 strain with the black 6 strain. And shown here is one example. You know, when you cross these two, each other, and then you, get, you will get a progeny uh, of this genotype. As you can see, you can narrow down that candidate gene to a smaller region because now by PCR genotyping, you know this region is from the B6 strand, not 129 strand, which doesn't have the mutation. So through that way, you can chop that candidate gene down to a smaller and a smaller region and then find exactly where the mutation is. All right, here is the real result. This slide summarized more than two years of crossing and PCR genotyping. But we will manage to map down that um, rich gene down to a 1.4 megabase interval. Now, if you look at that interval, this is before you have hundreds of genes in that uh, candidate uh, locus. And now, now only down to three genes. So we PCR all these regions, all the axons, and then sequence all the axons, and then the mutation turned out to be a loss of the axon 5 in a gene called astrotactin 2. So astrotactin 2 has 23 axons. Uh, as you can see, this is a non-rich. You can see all 23 axons are there. In the rich mice, you can see the axon 5 is missing, while all the rest of the 22 axons are still there and intact by sequencing. So we put more primers flanking that axon 5. You can see here is what, where the axon 5 is. And then those are the internal sequence. We put more primers. Those are the primer pairs to the arrow. You can see all these are corresponding to the primer pairs. As you can see, the deletion in the rich mice is about uh, 34 kilobase, I can see here, not including the axon 5. And then the flanking 34 kilobase also deleted. So most likely, the deletion is caused by the recombination between those two arrows. Those three arrows are the sequence called um, line element, which is a long interspersed element. They're identical. So you know, when you have a DNA sequence identical, they tend to 
uh, recombination and loop out the sequence in between. That's what happened. So these two uh, line elements recombine for some reason and then loop out the axon four, 5 sequence and also the flanking intronal sequence. <coughs> so we also sequence the candidate one, uh, a candidate region by uh, this is the uh, this is the next generation sequencing as you can see uh, this is the axon 5 locus and then these three arrows are the line elements and then you can see if you see peaks that means you have that sequence and I can see in the uh, rich mice, you know, the exon 5 is missing, the exon 5 is here, and also the flanking intranal sequence. So I told you the mutation is in 129 strain. Um, uh, there are three uh, different 129 in breast strains available. Uh, one called S1, one, uh, the other S6, and X1. Apparently only the X1 has the mutation, and all the other two inbred 129s, they don't. So this uh, this mutation must happen only in this strain and then kept all the way. Uh, so 129S6 is the most popular strain people use in, uh, for the mouse genetic experiments. Um, people, for a long time, it's really funny, for a long time people thought all oh, these 129 strains are identical, but as a matter of fact, clearly you can see they're not identical. So we did something, uh, we did a test cross. We know uh, 129X1 has the exactly same 34 kilobase deletion. So when we cross all these 129 strands to the non-rich FRISO6, as you can see, if you have the astrotectin 2 sequence from S1, the mouse show uh, no rich, and then so that's S6. But when you cross the non-rich FRISO6 mutant to the 129 strand X1 strand, X1 strand, you can see these mice develop uh, the rich phenotype. This clearly says, you know, that 34 kilobase deletion uh, is linked to that, uh, the rich phenotype. So sometimes if you have a deletion, uh, a big deletion especially, in a region, sometimes not only the sequence in, in that deletion matters, but also sometimes if the deletion is big enough, it contains some regulatory sequence, which means those sequence will affect the neighboring gene expression. So although it's not coding, but it's regulatory sequence. So uh, we test the expression of the two neighboring genes, DBC1 and TRIM32 by RT-PCR. Apparently, that deletion in the rich mice, they all, that deletion won't affect the expression of the neighboring gene. So to test conclusively, that deletion in the axon 5 is causing the phenotype. So we made a, a, a genetically engineered mouse line. In this case, we f we flanking only the exon five, which is a little bit over 100 base pairs. And remember, the deletion in the rich mice is about 34 kilobase uh, long. We made a mouse. We can now delete this only the exon five, but leave all the flanking intronal sequence intact. In that way, we can test whether it's the deletion of the exon five is causing the phenotype, or maybe the flanking intronal sequence is doing something weirdly. So shown here, I'm not going to bother with the details how we made the, uh, the mice, uh, but now you can see um, the strategies look like this. We have a sequence called the log speed size. Those log speed size are flanking the exon 5 without the Cree. Cree is a recombinase. We'll recognize the log speed size, sites and then loop out the sequence. You know, without the Cree, the exon 5 is intact there. With the Cree, Cree will loop out bind to the log speed size and loop out the sequence cause the deletion. So, um, so shown here is the phenotype. Uh, when you cross the uh, astrotactin 2 exon 5 flux mice, uh, flux mice means they have the log speed flanking, but the, there's no Cree, the exon 5 sequence is still there. You can see the exon 5 sequence is there, the flanking intronal sequence are there, the mice show no ridge. When you use the Cree to delete only the exon 5 and then keep all the flanking intronal sequence intact, now you can see the mouse develop a ridge. This is a very strong evidence to say that exon 5, only that 100 base pair is causing the ridge phenotype. So how exactly, I told you the exon 5 of the astrotectin 2 gene is causing the phenotype, but what exactly the ridge phenotype happened? So we did some uh, analysis on the postnatal uh, P3 back skin. Shown here are the flat mount of the lower back skin. As you can see, the wild type, they're parallel. 
In the regular freezer six, like they, they are nearly random. The reason why I said they're near, nearly random because when we quantify all the hair orientation to the body axis, to the anterior, posterior body axis, you can see, you, you see a bell curve distribution. You know, this is the zero degree means there will be the hair, the, imagine this is the body axis, anterior, posterior. Zero degree will means the hair follicle is totally parallel to that axis. You know, minus plus 90 degree means they deviate a little bit, but still they are pointing to the correct direction. You know, over 90 degree or over you know, minus 90, that would mean the hair point to the other direction. As you can see from this bell shape distribution, the, the non-rich mice, although you have the hair follicles point to all different directions, but you have a bias, you have more hair follicles point to the correct direction. So that's probably why after the alignment process, all of them, they're going to point to the correct direction because you have more from the very beginning. But if you look at that in the ridge, either the original 34 kilobase deletion ridge or the exon 5 deleted ridge, you can see that trend disappear. As a matter of fact, you have more hair follicles point to the wrong, uh, wrong direction. So uh, we quantify over 10,000 hair follicles and then can see in a, in the regular Frizzle 6, you can see this anterior to posterior bias is very dramatic. You have uh, over 60% of the hair follicles that point to the correct direction. However, in those ridge, you have more of the hair follicles point to the wrong direction, as you can see by the red bar distribution. So that's pro we think that's probably why after the self-realignment process, they all point to the wrong direction because at the very beginning, you have more distribute that way and then they all look to each other and then point to the wrong direction. So to summarize this part of the talk, we identified that deletion of astrotectin 2 exon 5 is causing the rich hair phenotype in the Frizzle 6 mutant mice. And then how the phenotype develop is because in the rich mice, you have a bias from the posterior to anterior, and then after the self-realignment process, you end it up with all the hairs point to the wrong direction. So in the next part of my talk, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about what this protein does. We found a very interesting phenomenon. This protein is cleaved. We call this intramembrane proteolysis. It simply means the protein somehow is cleaved. So uh, I showed you this uh, um, earlier. The mouse uh, astrotactin 2 has 23 axons. You can see shown here. There are uh, uh, one naturally uh, occurring splicing variants which will loop out the axon 4 and then the rich phenotype, the rich deletion, will delete the exon 5. Interestingly enough, the exon 4 and exon 5, they are all a multiple of 3, which means the, uh, the deletion of the exon 5 or the isoform of the exon 4, they're not going to change all the protein sequence because it's a multiple of 3. You know, the amino acids is encoded by 3 uh, nucleotides. You know, if you have a multiple of 3 and then you're going to the mutant protein is going to be missing some of the uh, amino acids, but all the downstream protein sequences are identical. And then if you look at the expression of that astrotectin 2 in the skin, as you can see, this is done by the RTPCR. We put primers flanking different region, you know, N-terminal region, middle part, C-terminal. You can see they're expressed in the wild type, non-rich and then rich. And then you can see both of the isoforms the exon 4 plus and minus are expressed equally strong in the skin. And then if you have the rich mutation, will, which it will cause the deletion of the exon 5, you can see the protein is, the, uh, the RNA is still expressed, but both of them are a little bit smaller than the wild type of counterpart because the exon 5 is also looped out. So when you look at the protein, by, a, uh, by the hydropathy plot, you can see it's predicted this is a transmembrane, two transmembrane, transmembrane protein, which means the protein will pass the, uh, the membrane twice. And then probably you cannot see that well here. So the orange color is the membrane. Uh, the N stands for the N terminal of that protein. The C stands for the C terminal of that protein. 
These will be the extracellular side of the cell. These will be the intracellular side of the cell. By prediction, it has this topology. And then the exon 5 and exon 4 that uh, I mentioned earlier, they are all both located in the intracellular loop. So to define the transmembrane topology of the astrotectin 2, we come up with a strategy. So we uh, tag the protein by two different tags shown here. One is green, the other is red. So the first one we made, we put both the double tags at the uh, N terminal and C terminal. They're both located outside the membrane. And then if you express those tagged astrotactin 2 in the cells and then perform the immunostaining, basically you use the antibody to bind those two tags and detect where the tags are located. You can see if you do the regular staining, which means you uh, use the detergent and penetrate, the antibody can access to both the outside of the cell and inside the cell. You can see the double tag protein expressed very nicely in the cells. However, when you do a surface staining on the live cell, which means now the antibody cannot get inside of the cell, can only bind to the surface of the cell. You can see when you do a surface staining, you can see both the red and green color for these constructs. So we made a second construct. We also double tag the protein, but the difference between this and this is we move this green tag to the intracellular loop. Now express this double tag protein in the cells. By the regular staining, you can see both tags are expressed there. But when you do a sur cell surface staining, and then you can only see the red, you cannot see the green, because this green part is embedded inside the, the cell. The antibody cannot get the access to it. So by doing this double tag um, assay, we determine the transmembrane topology of the uh, astrotectin 2, which is N-terminal LSI, and then transmembrane once, and then intracellular loop, and then transmembrane second, and then outside again. Both the N-terminal and C-terminal are facing outside. And one thing we found very um, strangely is, so I mentioned there are different isoforms of the astrotectin 2. You have a naturally occurring exon 4 skipping, which is when the, uh, when the, uh, when the DNA, when, the, when the, uh, uh, the cells make the RNA from the DNA, you know, the exon 4 is not included. It's called a splicing. Um, so naturally, you will have a wild type, which we also call full lens. And then if exon 4 skipping happen, you will have a little bit shorter than the full length. And then, of course, in the mutant, in the rich mutant, the exon 5 is deleted. And then if you put the both the exon 5 and X, exon 4 deleted, you will have an even shorter protein product because the sequence is smaller. So when we tag the protein, different isoforms with a tag at the very C terminal, when we express the protein and look at the protein on the Western, Western is an assay to look at the protein. The protein will migrate vertically according to their size. You know, the, the smaller the size the protein is, they will migrate a little bit faster. You know, the bigger the protein is, they will migrate a little bit slower. And then you also will have a protein size ladder, we call ladder. And then you can tell exactly what the protein size is because they run, the speed they run on the Western gel is proportional to the the size of the product. So in contrary to what we predicted, because the wild, ty wild type is 153 kilodotin, is somewhere over there. And then all these four isoforms, they run at the same height, which is smaller than the predicted. That's very strange to us. And then uh, this is the the old method of the filming. Uh, we use the film to develop Western, but now they have a, 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 a a better not, uh, uh, a way to do a Western, you can do a fluorescent Western, which has a, a, a more sensitive, you can detect the low amount of the protein. But you can see, still, the protein, the different isoforms, they're smaller than predicted. But if you look closely enough, you still have some, you can see some trace of the protein, they're running up and down, up and down, according the, to, to the predicted size. So that's a sign to us, the protein is somehow cleaved. So, uh, so when the protein is cleaved, so how can you know exactly when the protein is cut? 
So there is a method called uh, Adamant sequencing. Basically, you can purify a very, uh, a relatively large um, amount of that protein, and then you can send that protein for sequencing, and then you can know the amino acid sequence at the end terminal. So in that way, you can you can know where the protein is cleaved. So we did the experiment. So we ta we tag the protein shown here with the rim tag at the C terminal, and then we pull down the protein with the rim antibody on the beads, and then we can elude the protein out with a, a peptide. So in that way, we can get a, rarely, a relatively a pure uh, population of that protein, and then we can send for sequence. We can know exactly when the protein uh, uh, sequence starts at the end terminal. Shown here are the uh, protein we can purify, which is very uh, 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 strong, and then uh, uh, uni uh, in a one single population, so we can cut this band out and then send for sequencing. So here's the sequencing result. And then this fragment will start from this N, Q, and M. That will tell us you know, the cleavage is right in the second transmembrane uh, domain. So, uh, so the N terminal, when we pull down the uh, C terminal of the fragment, we also found the N terminal is also cool pulling down with the C. You can see these are the two fragments we sent for sequencing. But the look, if you look at here, you can see a little smaller fragment, which corresponding to the smaller side of the N terminal fragment. You can see these N terminal fragment and C terminal fragment, although it's cleaved, they're still linked together. Because when you pull down the, uh, the C terminal fragment, the N terminal fragment will co-precipitate with the C terminal. So this is the better way to show the protein is cleaved. So when we tag, remember we, we made the protein tag with two different tags, one green and then one red. And then if you run that protein, on, now if you run a double tag the protein on the western, you can see clearly see a two fragments, one green and one red. So that clearly tells you that protein is cleaved. So the exon 5 deletion, which is the rich mutation form of the, of the astrotactin 2, is also cleaved. You can see the urn terminal stays the same size because the cleave happens, happens right here. You know, the urn terminal and C terminal are of the same size. However, the red part, which is the urn terminal, is smaller because that exon 5 is at here. You know, the wild type folans will have a little bit longer sequence than the exon 5 deletion. So the N terminal and C terminal, I just mentioned, they're, although they're cleave, but they're still linked together. So we found out the N terminal and C terminal fragments are linked by a disulfur bond. So when you run the lysate, I showed this in the previous slide, when you run the double tag lysate on a Western with the BME, BME is called the beta mercaptal arsenal, which is a reducing reagent, will break down the disulfur bond. You can see these two bands are separated. You have an N terminal fragment, C terminal fragment by two colors. However, if you run exactly the same lysate without the BME, which means the disulfur bond now is intact, you can see now you can see a full length of the astrotactin 2. So that suggests you know, these two fragments, after the cleavage, they're still linked by the disulfur bond. So we did a lot of. Uh, uh, you know, disulfur bond is uh, formed by two systems. You know, one system at the N terminal, the other system at C terminal, they can form a disulfur bond and then hook those two fragments together. So we did a lot of, uh, you know, the way to find which disulfur, which system is paired those two fragments. So we made a lot of system to serum mutation. So basically, cysteine and serum are very similar structurally, but the difference is cysteine cannot form a disulfur bond. So in that way, we can destroy the disulfur bond to see which um, cysteine is responding for link these two proteins together, two protein fragments together. So long story short, we found out the cysteine 66 at the N terminal, and then for cysteine 470 at the C terminal, these are the primer, these are the pair of the cysteines linked to these two fragments. So shown here is the example. So when you run those, we made different of the mutation system to serum mutations on the uh, double tag astrotactins. So left side is the two color western again with the BME. 
no matter whether there is a Dasafaba or not, because BME is going to destroy it anyway, so you will end it up with the two fragments. However, when you mutate the uh, uh, cysteine 6, you can see if you run the protein lysate, wild type protein lysate, without the BME, you know, because of it will the, the protein 2 fragments will migrate together, showing a wild type, a bigger fragments here. If you mutate the cysteine 66, you can see they fail, I don't know how well you can see, but you fail to see the full length span because the two, uh, the, the two fragments are no longer linked together. So through the cysteine 2 serum mutagenesis, we identify these pair of the cysteines are responsible for that uh, link those two fragments. So uh, this show you one example of the negatives. Um, you know, uh, again, so the, 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 the mutation, the system mutation I showed you in the previous slide, you mutate the system, you fail to form a bond. So, so a lot of the systems, if they are not responsible for that uh, bonding, if you mutate it, they still can form the uh, uh, disulfide bond. Shown here are a few of the that examples. As you can see, this, these are the, uh, without the BME, you can see the wild type will show a full length because, you know, the two pieces can still link together. If you mutate, the system is responsible for that disulfide bond. They cannot you know, the two fragments cannot link together. You don't see that full length span. But if you mutate, those systems are not responsible for that uh, disulfur bond. They can still form that. So astrotactin 2 is clearly a cleave. Um, so what the sequencing requirement for that cleavage? So one way to figure it out is um, people do mutagenesis. You know, we, because we know where exactly the cleavage happens, so we can always replace the native sequence with the uh, other uh, non-relevant amino acid sequence and to see whether that will change or abolish that cleavage. And then we know that sequence is required for that cleavage. So the experiment we did here is called alanine mutagenesis. So shown here is the primary sequence of the astrotactin 2. Here is the transmembrane domain second. The red arrow points, arrowhead points to where the protein is cleaved. So the idea is like this. You can replace all these sequence, different amino acid sequence with alanine. That will abolish that recognition site, and then the protein will fail to be cleaved. So when we did, the, uh, we did the, all these A, B, C, D through I, all these are the different mutagenesis we made uh, spanning that uh, cleavage site. Very, uh, to our surprise, all of them, they're still cleaved which means no matter how you replace all these sequences with alanine, all of them, the protein are still can be cleaved, which is uh, very surprising to us. So I, when I present this work to, uh, I forgot exactly what audience, but there is a guy sitting in the audience suggest they start talking to me, it's like, you know, the way you do, you know, the way we do here is alanine mutagenesis, which is very routine. You can, alanine is a very small uh, nucleotide. Uh, no, nucleotide is a very small amino acid. The side chain is very small. So uh, you basically can replace it. And then he said to me, he said, like, uh, you should do a, 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 a different sc a leucine scanning. Uh, leucine is another uh, new, relatively neutral uh, uh, amino acid, but the, uh, the branching, the side chain is a little bit bigger. So he said, in that way, it might cause a dramatic, affinity, a dramatic effect to that uh, recognition. So I, yeah, I'm so glad I followed his advice, but the, the thing is I really cannot remember who gave my advice, so I cannot really uh, give my credit to that audience, you know, that people. But I did exactly the same uh, uh, mutagenesis. Now I replace those with the leucine instead of alanine. Now you can see. You know, the wild type, the double tag protein can be cleaved. When you replace those sequence flanking that cleavage site with the leucine, you can see, you know, some of them can still be cleaved. But if you look at the number three and the number four, which is very close to, the, to that cleavage site, when you replace these three sequence, or these two sequences with alanine, the protein now is not cleavable. So you can see when you run this gel with the BME, this is the, with the BME, you know, the protein stay at the single piece. So this gives us the confidence, you know, this primary sequence is contains that uh, uh, cleavage specificity for the astrotectin 2 intramembrane proteolysis. So we did a little bit more. 
So the, the, all these experiments we did, we first you know, mutate uh, uh, three or two in a row. We don't want to go one by one. Otherwise, you, you, ha you will end up generating like, a lot of the mutants, right? So the way we did this, we do this through blocks. We mutate two at a, a time or three at a time. So uh, through the previous slide I showed you, we know this three and four is doing something for that recognition. Now we zoom in. Now we mutate a single amino acid in that region and then to see which one is responsible. As you can see from this Western picture, you know, wild type is cleave, and then you can see this N466, which is this one. You can see when you replace just that single amino acid with a leucine, that totally abolished that cleavage. So, um, you know, if you mutate the nucleotide, the amino acid sequencing flanking that, some of it will, will cause dramatic effect, some will cause less dramatic. But you can see if you mutate this V, you will also almost abolish that cleavage. So that tells us this transmembrane sequence of trans, second transmembrane sequence of the protein is required for that recognition for the uh, cleavage. So how about the sufficiency? Sufficiency is the way uh, I put a diagram here. So normally, here is the diagram of the astrotactin 2. It has two transmembrane domains, transmembrane 1 and transmembrane 2. You know, the protease will recognize the sequence in the transmembrane 2 and then cleave the protein into 2. And then there are normally there are other type of transmembrane proteins. Normally, they don't, they're not cleaved. So imagine if we can replace the transmembrane domain with the astrotactin 2 transmembrane domain, whether we can drive the cleavage of those proteins that normally are not cleaved. So this is to test whether that sequence, you know, transmembrane 2 sequence is sufficient to drive the, drive the cleavage. So the protein shown here, we did two of the transmembrane protein. One is called ASGR1, the other is called CD74. So basically what we did was we tagged these proteins again by two colors so we can follow the cleavage. And then this, this is the native their endogenous transmembrane sequence, and then we can replace the sequence with the astrotactin 2 transmembrane, and then see if the cleavage happens, the protein will be like 8 kilodalton shorter, because that cleavage will cleave the left part of the protein, make the protein smaller. If that transmembrane sequence is not sufficient to drive the cleavage, the protein will stay at the same size of the wild type. So when we did that experiment shown here, these are the wild type uh, double tagged protein. You can see both tags are expressed. The size is expected around uh, 49 kilodalton. Both the N terminal tag and the C terminal tag are there. When we replace the transmembrane domain with the astrotactin 2 second transmembrane sequence, you can see clearly now the protein you can see a smaller size of the protein. The protein now is cleaved. Although the cleavage is not 100%, but you can see that sequence is definitely capable of driving that cleavage. Means that that specific 21 amino acid sequence is sufficient to drive the proteolysis. So uh, all the data sh I showed here is uh, done by overexpression in the, uh, in the cell lines. So whether that cleavage is also happened in vivo, that's a very important question. So to address that question is not easy because when we do the analysis in the cell, we tag that protein with a small tag. You know, there are always good antibodies for that detection of that tag. But for the native protein, they're not, um, it's very difficult to get a good antibody to detect that, right? Because the tag sequence is always the same. You have very good established antibody to detect that tag. Because that tag is fusion to the protein, you will know, you know where the protein is by just simply by looking at the tag. So to uh, look at the native uh, endogenous protein, so we made an uh, antibody uh, against a region um, uh, at the C terminal shown here in the green bar. So the antibody is very good, luckily. Well, this is not the first time. So the first time we generate an antibody, the antibody cannot recognize anything. And then we bought the antibody from commercial uh, um, source. Again, that antibody is like, um, I, I wouldn't even comment on that antibody. They show very beautiful you know, quality on the website, but it turns out you cannot even detect overexpression protein, which is not, most of the case, they, uh, they overdo their, uh, um, it's uh, like a cells, 
trick they do it. So like uh, all our antibodies are very good guarantee, but that's not the case. So we ended up generating a homemade antibody a second time. Now this antibody can detect the protein very beautifully, both in the overexpression cell lines, but also in the endogenous uh, protein lysate. Shown here is the example from the cerebellum. So astrotactin 2 is also highly expressed in the cerebellum. So when we harvest the protein out, you can see the protein is also cleaved in vivo. You know, the predicted size is around there, but if you look at this, it's the, the size is smaller than expected. So that says, you know, those, uh, this astrotactin 2 process in cleavage also happened in vivo. So astrotactin 2, the reason why it's called astrotactin 2, because it has a brother called astrotactin 1. Um, astrotactin 1 and 2, they're very similar in, uh, in terms of structure. Astrotactin 1 is also a 2 transmembrane protein, in uh, N terminal, C terminal facing outside. So shown here is partial alignment of these two proteins. Uh, astrotactin 1 at the bottom, astrotactin 2 at the, uh, at the top. You can see we did the same thing, uh, similar thing for astrotactin 1. We found astrotactin 1 is also cleaved. It's cleaved in the exactly same way as astrotactin 2. So shown here is the transmembrane sequence. You can see although 1 and 2, the transmembrane sequence are very divergent. It's about 50% conservancy. You can see the cleavage site is right exactly the same, identical. And then if you look at the two cysteines, you probably cannot see that well. You remember the two cysteines, one cysteine 6 and the other cysteine of 460, those are the two cysteines responsible for the disulfur bond and link those two fragments together. Those two cysteines are also conserved in astrotectin 1, shown here. You see the little c is there for astrotectin 1. And then this little c is also there for the astrotectin 1. So when we mutate those two cysteines in the astrotectin 1, now the um, position is 35 and 406, you can see exactly the same thing. So the, this is the single tag, a uh, rim tag astrotectin 1. You know, with the BME, they're all smaller because it's cleaved. So here is the full lens. And then if you run the lysate without the BME, you can see the wall type, the two fragments, although cleaved, that they can still link together by the disulfur bond. You can see that's the full lens. And then if you mutate either the 35 or the 406, now the protein uh, two fragments fail to attach to each other because there's no uh, disulfur bond. So all these suggest, you know, both astrotactin 1 and astrotactin 2, they're cleaved in a, a conserved mechanism, but after the cleave, they're still linked together. Those cleavage events happen both in vitro but, and also in vivo. So uh, here are the summary of the large part of my talk. Uh, we identify, well, we define the astrotactin 2 topology by tag the protein at the two uh, different positions. And then we show the N-terminal and C-terminal are both facing outside at the extracellular space. And then both of them are cleaved. Uh, there's the disulfur bond, link them together. And then the astrotactin 2 transmembrane sequence, the 21, N, uh, um, 21 uh, uh, amino acids, contains sufficient information for that substrate recognition. And also, if you put that into a, a native protein, it's sufficient to drive the cleavage ectoptically. So that's pretty much what I'm going to tell you. But I have to say, all the studies, we generate more questions than answers. I will just list a few here, shown as a future directions. So one obvious question is, what protein is cleaved the protein? Um, uh, so there are several known, um, there, there are actually four categories of the protease, um, intramembrane protease, they can cleave uh, the protein. So uh, we try the inhibitors, well, there's uh, uh, broad inhibitors of the protease. We tried all these uh, protease inhibitors in, in the cell culture. None of them can abolish that cleavage, which means you know, that cleavage is probably uh, regulated through other either novel protease or some unknown mechanism, which is quite interesting. Uh, so to tackle that, I think that requires more uh, non-biased screening method to identify exactly what protease is cleaved the, uh, the protein. The second question is why the protein is cleaved? Um, so uh, now we have a, 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 
we know exactly, you know, by mutating one uh, sequence, one uh, amino acid sequence, we can make the protein non-cleavable. We can make the protein resistant to the cleavage. So we can, in ideally, you can imagine we can make, make a mouse mutant, the protein cannot be cleaved. And then we can address that question, why the cleavage is necessary. So the other question is, so after the cleavage, so why the two fragments are still linked together? So again, I don't know the answer yet. So uh, we identify the cysteine uh, required for that bonding. Again, we can simula similarly, we can make a cysteine mutation for that protein, and then the protein no longer bond to each other because the disulfur bond now is destroyed. So I told you uh, the astrotactin 2, the rich mutants, is the exon 5 deletion. The exon 5 deletion is a small in-frame deletion. The protein is still there. The majority of the sequence is still there. So what exactly the protein does? So uh, now we made a mouse, new mouse mutant, so we can totally abolish that protein. Now we can, um, uh, we, we made a mouse, we flanked the exon one instead of the exon five. The exon one contains the ATG, which is the translation uh, starting site. So when you abolish the exon one, and then the protein no longer can be made. So in that way, we can generate a mouse without that protein being produced rather than producing a smaller fragment of that protein. So in, with that mouse, we can address what exactly the function of the astrotectin 2. So, so far I told you all the astrotectin 2 is related to the hair orientation, but astrotectin 2 is also widely expressed in the brain, in the development brain. So does its uh, 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 brother astrotectin 1. So astrotectin 1 and 2, they're both highly expressed in the development brain. So there are recently um, human studies link the astrotactin 2 to several neuronal developmental disease. So for example, the Alzheimer's, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, the autism, the ADHD, and also not only the neurodevelopmental disease, but also it's linked to the neurodegenerative disease. Um, some SNP, again, some polymorphism in the astrotectin 2 gene is linked to the early onset of the Alzheimer's disease. So all the, human, the nature of the human uh, studies are all linkage, right? You can say this is linked to that disease, but that cannot provide some causal effect. You cannot say the astrotectin 2 mutant is causing the neurodegenerative or neurodevelopmental uh, uh, disease in humans because it's all correlation. So with the astrotectin 2 mutants in hands, we have a mouse model. We can start to ask, address whether those mutant mouse model can show any of the uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, that would be a very interesting area to explore. So not only the astrotectin 2, we also made an astrotectin 1, just in case sometimes the two proteins are doing uh, we call this redundantly, which means you knock out one, you still have a backup, you won't see any phenotype. So now we have both mutant mouse in, the, uh, in hand, we can knock them out both and to address the function of the astrotectins in the brain. So uh, hopefully I can bring, well, all these are gonna be uh, uh, happening here in the, in, at UW, hopefully the next time I can bring more chapters of the story about astrotectin too. Um, so uh, that's all I uh, have for today. I really thank all your attention, but I, I, although I acknowledge my mentors in the first slides, I still have uh, one more acknowledgement slides in the end. So as I said, all these work are done in Jeremy's lab. Here are a few um, uh, people in my old lab, we collaborate and then we start this fantastic journey to identify from the very beginning um, naturally occur by serendipity, a uh, mouse phenotype and linked to this uh, very mysterious astrotectin 2 project. Uh, who knows, you know, from the hair, we ended up with uh, autism, or uh, ended up with other things. Oh, one thing I forgot to tell. So the astrotectin 2 is also highly expressed in the testes. You know, the reason why I'm interested in testes is because uh, 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 Richard, uh, I mentioned my PhD advisor, he is a developmental biologist, and also he's a reproductive biologist. When I was in his lab, I was trained as, uh, I was studying the testicular development and testicular tumor. So I had a background in um, uh, testicular development. So I look at the expression of astrotectin 2 in the testicular, it's very highly expressed. And then it looks like some of the mutant might have a smaller testis. You know, maybe, you know, it has a phenotype there. Everything's linked. 
Uh, I want to thank Megan, Megan McGuire. Uh, she's the research administrator in our department of dermatology. She's a fantastic woman. She helps in the great to set up the labs. And you, you know, setting up lab is a totally a different ball game than doing an experiment. She has been a tremendous help to me setting up the lab. So Sam is a, a technician in the lab. Bo is a graduate student John the lab. Both of them contribute some of the experiment I mentioned. So Sam did the, the single um, Allen, a single uh, uh, leucine metagenesis, and Bo is um, continuing on uh, jumping on the boat, help us, you know, to crack the astrotectin to mystery. That's all I have. Um, thank you all for attention. <laughs> Now I'm very happy to take any question. Yes. Can you clarify for us um, when you were doing all those leuci when the amino acid substitutions? Yes. Is that a new strain of mouse for each amino acid? Okay. So I was told I have to repeat the question. So the question was, so all these leucine mutants uh, uh, we generate for the astrotectin two, whether those are done by in the mouse, make a mutant mouse, or is done by other means. I can tell you those are done by simply over, make the construct overexpressed in the cell lines. You know, imagine making a mutant mouse is not that easy. If you make like 20 plus mutant mice, that's going to cost tons of money. I hope I have the money to do so, but definitely we're going to pick one to make the mutant because now we know uh, which, you know, amino acids required for that cleavage. We can just make that one to make a cleavage resistant mouse line so we can carry you know, characterize what it does for the protein. So it's in vivo, but it's because it's alive, but it's, it's in the cell line, not from an intact model. Yeah, it is a construct we dump into the cells, so the cells will overexpress that protein, and then we can look at that protein. And also, it's a convenient way, so because by in vitro, you can tag the protein with different tags, you can look at the tags and then look at the expression. Uh, generate, uh, if you make a mouse of a double tag, that requires a sophisticated work to do that. Um, but I yes. I don't mean to be too quibbling, but I was a plant guy, and if you did something in cell culture in a test tube, you still call it in vivo, and in vitro would be cell free. Is yeah. that how you use it in, in your line, or is that different? Does in vivo mean only in a yeah. tag? So, so different, what well, the question is, is related, I, I re, I, the question is related to the definition of in vivo versus in vitro. Um, apparently different people uh, from different fields, they have their own criteria. So if you are biochemists, you will think, you know, if you have a cell to make the stuff, that's in vivo, right? You have the machinery to build. But for me, I'm a developmental biologist, more I'm a mouse geneticist. To me, not, you know, everything help happen happens outside a mouse is called in vitro. So you only make a, make a mouse line that's in vivo. Uh, probably my standard bar is a little bit too high, but that's the way I uh, um, uh, um, set the uh, criteria. That's, that's fine as long as it, that's yeah. a very interesting distinction I've never heard before. So that was yeah. very cool, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? All right. If not, thank you very much. All right, thank you.